This is Lois Whaley for Women Today and Yesterday. My guest today, very special guest, is Peggy Gish. Um, Peggy, um, I just heard you speak the other night. Yeah, at Baker Center. At Baker Center. Mm -hmm. Right, and you were talking about uh, your trips to Iraq. Yeah, telling stories of Iraqi people, you know, all that they've gone through, but also a lot of their efforts to work for justice and peace. Yes. Yeah. And that's something you've been working on for quite a long time, actually. That's now. right. Beginning in, was it 2002 that you first went to Iraq? That's, yes, October 2002 is when I first went to Iraq. But you uh, were there when the uh, fighting actually started, when the American troops came right. in. Right, yeah, five months later in March 2003. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So you have seen quite a bit of the whole Iraq Yes, war. right. Some of the really horrible, horrific kinds of things, as well as the very, some very positive efforts to try to rebuild and to care for each other in the struggle. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you were also introducing your new book. That's right. Right. Uh -huh. Right. Walking Through Fire? Walking through fire, right. <laughs> and it's not just that I walk through fire. I mean, uh -huh. you can interpret it that way, but it's mostly the Iraqi people walking through fire. Uh-huh, yes. Yeah. Because uh, mm -hmm. war is never pleasant. It isn't, and it does not really um, solve problems like people think it's supposed to do that. Uh, war really, like, in Iraq, what I saw firsthand was that it destroyed a whole society, mm -hmm. it just broke it apart, and it's still not, you know, pieced back together. And it's going to take, I don't know, decades probably till mm -hmm. the whole society is a little more stable and yes. secure. Right. I um, have mm -hmm. I've been uh, reading up on World War One uh -huh. because. Um, I'm giving a little serious talk, very short, uh -huh. but a yeah. rather serious talk, on Sunday at the uh, celebration for International Women's Day. Yeah. And um, I chose World War I because although it didn't begin in the spring of 1914, it did yeah. begin in the summer of 1914, and that's 100 years ago this year. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, the aftermath was, if anything, maybe worse than the war itself, uh -huh. although certainly not, I'm sure, the people who were directly involved in the war in, in 1914 to 18 mm -hmm. would, uh, would not feel that way, probably. Of course, they're all gone by now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the last of the uh, old soldiers. But uh, it was quite a 20th century. Yeah, quite a t 20th century. And may I ask uh, how old you are? I am 71. 71. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I've lived a good many years to see a lot. <laughs> yes. Three score and ten plus. That's right, I know. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been around for four score and a little plus, too. Okay. Right. So I remember maybe about 10 years more than you do. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was born during the sec Second World War. I see. I mean, I don't uh -huh. remember it, but, yes. you know, remember the aftermath. Of it. The aftermath, yes. Yeah. And, and your parents, of course, would have been quite affected. That's right. Uh-huh. They were. Where are you from originally, Peggy? I grew up in Chicago. Chicago. In the, right in the city. Right yeah. downtown, huh? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so that really did influence my life as far as seeing the, the struggles of people living in poverty, mm -hmm. the various kinds of racial injustice that was going on, and, under, you know, helped me to understand more of why people in our society are really trying to work for change because it has really oppressed them or suppressed their lives. Yes. Mm -hmm. So change for yeah. the better yeah. is necessary. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. My uh, grandfather 
went to the University of Chicago oh, uh -huh. long, long ago, yeah. um, the 1890s. Oh, wow. In fact, he was in the first class. Hmm. It must have started in mm -hmm. 1893, perhaps, yeah. mm -hmm. because he was in the, you know, he was like number 450 or something wow. like that. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> long ago, and uh, he got training there for a Baptist ministry. Mm -hmm. um, the university was founded by John D. Rockefeller, oh. who was I a very know, staunch yeah. Baptist. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've been in and out of Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> once in the old days, at least, once you got there, you usually had to wait around for a while. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> To leave because of the way that the uh, trains ran. Oh yeah, right. Back in the old days, <laughs> right. okay. you might be there for ten or twelve hours between. Um, oh right, between different connections coming, or whatever. Yeah, coming from the west mm -hmm. as I was doing, yeah. and then going on to the to the east, mm -hmm. uh, New York Central. Okay. Um, at least I can remember a couple of long waits, but that was long, long ago now, of course. Uh, although Chicago is a big hub for the air, the airlines too, uh -huh, isn't right. it? Right. Yeah. Do you still have family in, in Chicago? I have two sisters that live west of Chicago, not uh -huh. too far. So I do travel there, mm -hmm. you know, occasionally to see them. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's nice that yeah. you have some folks that you can go yeah, and visit. <laughs> right. The house that I grew up in is no longer there. Oh, There's a big uh -huh. hospital complex. Oh, really? Yeah. At that area, which, you know, is, is good for the community. Yes, whatever. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, cities tend to change like that, mm -hmm. to yeah. right. tear things down and put up something taller or uh -huh. whatever, right. yeah. broader, wider, whatever. Yeah, um, but how long have you lived here in Athens County? Well, it's, I'm going to say 36 years. 36 years. Yeah. It's quite a long time. Uh-huh. So this is really the longest, this is the place I've lived the longest yes. in my life. So <laughs> this, is, this is really my home. Yes. And I've really learned to love the hills of southeastern Ohio. Yes. It's really they fun. are beautiful. Yeah. I was raised in Nevada, which uh, tends to be pretty desert yeah. country, really desert mm -hmm. country. But my brother still lives in the oasis of Nevada, which is a uh, irrigated farming uh -huh. section, right on US 50. Hmm. Can get on US 50 right here in Athens and just That's keep good. going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I do that very often, as yeah. you might guess, but, uh -huh. but it's, it is a connection, mm -hmm. one of those threads. That, yeah. And you live out in the country, right? I do, on a farm about seven miles right outside of Athens, uh -huh. and where I could just go up the hill from my house and go back into the woods and walk for miles. Oh, yes. It's just really lovely. Right. I'm, it's a pleasant. real privilege to have that. It is, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so have you been there the whole 36 years? Yes. I mean, uh -huh. base, base time. Base now there. We're, no, right. we're not talking about Iraq at this that's point. That's right. I have gone other places in the meantime, but that's where I've lived for yes. the last 36 years. Right. And I believe you have a, a sort of a new little house. Yes. Thanks to friends from the area yes. who, after Art's death, they... Uh, volunteered labor and mm -hmm. skills to build me this new little 20 by 20 cabin, oh. which has been a real gift. Anyway, it has allowed me to stay on the farm yes, and not have to deal with the old farmhouse and the upkeep of the other buildings. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, that's, that was a real gift. Yeah. I remember those emails from Rod Nippert saying, yes. Rod <laughs> come was, out and help. <laughs> I'm Rod afraid was, I never personally did. Uh -huh. but, <laughs> okay. but you supported in many other ways. Yes. That's one of the things I, I think about a lot is how much love and support I've received from the people of this area. Yes. And how helpful that has been for me in my peacemaking work. Yes. It really has given me you know, more strength to do the work that I've done. Yes. So I thank everybody here and out there <laughs> for, the, for the love and support that I've received. Right. Mm -hmm. 
But you have family too, don't you? I mean, you have I, some children, yeah. grandchildren. Uh huh. I have two boys, one living in Pennsylvania with three daughters, and another son living in San Francisco with two daughters. Oh, lots so, of girls. Yeah, so five wonderful granddaughters. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's interesting how they sometimes skip a generation. Yeah. I mean, you had sons. I had sons. And now you have granddaughters. Now I have granddaughters, yeah. That uh, was the same way with uh -huh. my brother. Uh -huh. My brother had sons, and now he, he had two sons, and, and then he had four granddaughters. Mm -hmm. so, wow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Of course, it all <clears throat> evens out in the end anyway, but, but mm -hmm. still, it's interesting yeah. how, that, how that occurs. How did you happen to choose Walking Through Fire for um, your title? Well, I started to think about something short that would kind of symbolize what Iraqi people have experienced. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have the book just focused on me, mm -hmm. and it isn't. I mean, I do tell a lot of my stories of how I dealt with things and what helped me get through difficult times there. So there is a personal stories in there, but the main focus is on the Iraqi people. And so I've seen them as walking through fire. Um, tremendous difficulties and struggle. And it's not just the literal fire of the war, which, you know, is true, but also now the fire of, of just trying to rebuild and the chaos that came after the war mm -hmm. so, and the many difficulties. So walking through fire. The other part of the, the title of the book is Iraqi Struggle for Justice and Reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And so I am focusing on the fire, but also on the resiliency, the creativity, and um, the strength of the Iraqi people to rise up in spite of what they've gone through and to to really care for each other in it and to try to pull things together in a way that rebuilds uh, in a more just kind of society, uh, finding ways of more peaceful ways of dealing with conflict there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've, they went through the, like the, the years under Saddam and other brutal dictators. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's part of what they've gone through. And then then they've gone through the sanctions, mm -hmm. which really devastated them economically and devastated the medical system, you know, all mm -hmm. just really like I knocked them back a decade or two as far as medical care, uh, education, other kinds of social uh, aspects of their society were knocked back. And so now they have a tremendous hurdle in trying to kind of pull things together to rebuild their society, to, to create civil society mm -hmm. out of the ashes of a more dictatorial society. Yes. So these are tremendous hurdles. And, uh, but in my work, we would always look for the creative people that were working to better, uh -huh. you know, their own people. And then we would so the word walking is meaningful there because when we come in there, we don't just impose our agenda on them. Right. We don't come in with our ideas of what they should do to rebuild, even though we come with a bias toward nonviolence. I mean, that's clear. No. Uh, and we do encourage a nonviolent, a peaceful way approaches. But we go in and to meet with me many individuals or groups, and then we walk with them, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we stand with them, and we work together with them as they rebuild, as they find alternatives to violence in their society. Now, uh, you mentioned we. Yeah, Are we. you speaking of Christian Peacemaker Team? That's right, I am, uh -huh. and I'm thinking that, but not saying it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm there with an organization called Christian Peacemaker Teams. And it comes out of, it was started by 
Quakers, Mennonites, and Brethren churches, the three mainline peace churches in the United States uh, that have always had a pacifist point of view and saw that as mm -hmm. part of what it meant to be a Christian. And so our, when I say we, I also mean that there's an ongoing team that lives in Iraq and shares an apartment or a house together and then different people rotate in and out. Mm -hmm. And so each time I would go, I would just go back to that apartment and, and it would be a few different people there, but mm -hmm. we would always work as a team and make decisions as a team. And, uh, you know, you just can't go in there alone oh, and try no, to do this sort of right. thing. A small team, I mean, it wouldn't be more like four to six people. Four to six people. At any one time. Mm -hmm. So it's small, but our, in spite of that, we were able to, I don't think, make a lot of difference in mm -hmm. people's lives. Even if we weren't able to, like, suddenly change everything, you know. No. I mean, no one can do that. Just miraculously come in and bring peace, whatever, to all mm -hmm. the chaos that was going on, but we can work with Iraqi people in this city, in that city, to support their projects, mm -hmm. to support their actions uh, toward peacemaking, toward yes. building justice in the midst of what was going on. Well, you mentioned various cities. Um, yeah. I think Actually, you have two books, isn't That's that right? That's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, the, the first book is called mm -hmm. A Journey of Hope and Peace. And um, that covers the early part, the first part of your, your work in Iraq with Christian peacemaker teams. That's right. It tells the story of going there before the war, what it was like under Saddam, what the, mm -hmm. under the sanctions what people were living with. Mm -hmm. And so we lived right among the people. And it, then it goes on to share, share about how we worked there and how we tried to speak out against a war coming and try to prevent that war, but of course we're not successful. And then it shares about the time during the bombing of Baghdad when I was there and what it was like to be in the midst of war and what how the people were coping and dealing with this. And then it goes on through the next year mm -hmm. to talk about what it was like afterward, uh, what individuals and groups were doing to, to try to uh, deal with the chaos. But also then it, it shares about our efforts to, to expose the abuses that were going on in the U.S. prison system mm, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we started that work, we were just simply helping Iraqi families find their loved ones who were in prison. They didn't know where they were or, you know, to get help. And then as we began to hear their stories mm -hmm. and then the stories of their family member after they came out of prison, we discovered that you know, how they were treated was very abusive, very brutal. Mm -hmm. And so we decided that that needed to be, you know, shared publicly. Mm -hmm. We call that work truth-telling. 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 It's not that we have the total truth about everything. Yeah. But it's that things like that are, the authorities try to hide them or try to cover them up. Mm -hmm. And so we try to bring them to light and tell the truth about it so that it, they could be changed. Yes. And so when we wrote our report on 74 prisoners uh, and what they had gone through, mm -hmm. then we took that report to uh, government officials, U.S. government officials there in Iraq and here, and we made recommendations for change. And we were part of a movement of Iraqis and other international groups who were trying to, you know, push out that what was going on, try to uh, work for change yes. in, the, in the whole, in the whole system. 
Right. Well, and as you point out, um, what Iraq had already gone through, um, I mean, it was almost a 10-year war, wasn't there, between Iran and Iraq? It was, yes. Very long, in the 80s, I think. In the 80s, and it was during that time when Saddam had used chemical weapons on oh. the Kurds in the north, and later when we would move to the north, later when our team moved to the north, then we learned a lot more about that. But, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that war between Iran and Iraq was also devastating for the people there and a lot we met you know almost every family was affected by that and had mm -hmm. either members of their family who had been killed in that war or injured you know and, and mm -hmm. uh, immediately followed mm -hmm. by Saddam's yes. invasion of Kuwait exactly uh, which, which was, must have been uh, mm -hmm. you know especially when the uh, yeah uh, groups, including the U.S., moved against yeah. against what he was up to in Kuwait, and yeah, which was you know. they they stopped short of uh, in going into Iraq itself, though, didn't they? Um, yeah, George uh, George Bush, forty one, the mm -hmm. the father, mm -hmm. um, was involved with the war yeah. in um, uh, nineteen ninety. I believe 91. It was. 91. Yeah. 91. Yeah, and so our troops were actually inside Iraq in the southern area. In the southern in the, area. The main roads that that um, you travel to come from Kuwait on in t up north toward Baghdad. Mm -hmm. But the troops did not uh, invade in the same way that they did in 2003. I mean, they didn't take over areas of Iraq. Mm -hmm. Right. They were mainly in battles with Iraqi troops along, the, along those routes and did not really try to take over the government mm -hmm. at that point or go as far as to try to topple Saddam mm -hmm. as they did Which later. Which son, <laughs> George Bush, George W. Uh -huh. Bush, the, yeah. the 43, That's right. the 43rd president uh -huh. uh, did. I remember yeah. that, um, I'm just, you know, remembering back to January of 1991. Mm -hmm. um, we happened to be in northern Virginia that year. Okay. Bob was um, on a sabbatical leave, uh -huh. and uh, we were staying actually in the home of my late uh, uncle and aunt, mm -hmm. right on the edge of uh, Fairfax, quite close uh -huh. to Washington, D.C., yeah. and... Uh, I can remember it was like January 15th or just about that time that uh, uh, a line was drawn in the sand, so to speak, mm -hmm. by the American government, and yeah. they said um, they would start military mm -hmm. action if, uh, yeah. you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I remember that that day coming to an end, you know. Yeah. I was in <laughs> northern Virginia, uh -huh. far away, but I could see the sunset coming up and thinking, oh my, you know. the. Yeah, and I was here in Athens, and uh -huh. there were large groups, a large group of people who were meeting, and we were out on the streets having protests yes. to try to prevent the war from coming. And then we, we made plans of what we would do if it actually did occur. And so when we actually started, you know, the war, our part of the war, you know, going into Iraq to deter the Iraqi troops, you know, that were go had gone into Kuwait. Uh, this was in January 1991. This is in January 1991. We had a mass uh, protest on the street of Athens on the on the intersection, at the intersection of, of court and union. And 103 of us were arrested sitting down in the middle of the intersection mm -hmm. uh, in small circles, very nonviolently, very peacefully trying to, you know, protesting yes. that war. We had uh, uh, some visitors mm -hmm. who came from Athens, uh -huh. brought their sleeping bags. They came for a big protest uh -huh. in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and it was about that time. Uh, I don't think it, it wasn't right at the, right when the bombs were about to fall, so to speak, but yeah. 
it was very close to that time and mm -hmm. these friends went downtown to do their protesting. Yeah. Yes, it was uh, quite a thing and I remember too um, in 2003 when um, the deadline was approaching mm -hmm. once again in March, isn't that right? Maybe yeah. it was April, March. Uh -huh. Yeah, March. Yeah, it was Something actually. Something about the spring. Uh, going in Iraq, it was March 20th when the actual bomb started to fall. It was the morning. Here, it was March 19th. So you often see. hear those two different dates because of the time change. Time change. Yeah. But um, mm -hmm. whether it was the 20th or the 19th, you actually saw them falling, right? Yes, right. We did. And I remember waking up. For us, it was like about 5.30 in the morning, mm, waking mm -hmm. up to hear the first bombs fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how I don't know, I just felt so horrible when yeah. I heard that and I knew it had actually started, even though we did hear what Bush was saying and we knew it was very likely to happen mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the week before that, it would have been about March 12th, um, I went with friends, uh, the Overbees, you know, yeah. the Overbees, mm -hmm. and uh, Chuck drove to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Code Pink was just getting organized, a women's group, yeah. uh, anti-war mm -hmm. women's group. They were the ones who were organizing this, uh -huh. what turned out to be the last big protest in Washington mm -hmm. the uh, week yeah. before. Yeah, some of them, some of Code Pink were in Iraq. I mean, mm -hmm. they weren't there. I don't think they were there when the bombs fell, but they mm -hmm. came Very ahead quickly. of that. And mm -hmm. we, we, with them and other international groups, I mean, when I say international, I'm talking about groups from Japan, from China, from Italy, from all around the world were there to protest and to try to prevent a war. But there was one time when Code Pink was there and they helped all of us together organized a march down one mm -hmm. of the main streets along the Tigris River. Mm -hmm. And Iraqi people joined in with us mm -hmm. and we marched, you know, as a peace march yes. and then had a press conference. And that's where I first met Medea Benjamin and others from Code oh, Pink yes, yes. was there in Iraq. I remember um, hearing her speak. I think may, it yeah. might have been the next year uh -huh. It was very early in the war um, yeah. that uh, she came to Athens and, and mm -hmm. spoke at the old yeah. Baker Center. Yeah. yeah. And then she and others from Code Pink did come back and forth afterward. I mean, they, they would go on like uh, maybe two-week trips. I mean, they didn't have a continual presence there, but mm -hmm. they would come back and forth and uh, support groups that were of Iraqis that were also working to try to, you know, get the truth out about what was going on there. Right. Well, that mm -hmm. march in Washington and march of, of mm -hmm. the march, small m march, yeah. <laughs> in March, <laughs> <Right>. capital M uh, month, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, was um, uh, one of the things I remember were the, I think they call themselves the Raging Grandmas or something oh, like yeah. that. They're uh -huh. <clears throat> a group that um, were singers, actually. Hmm. And they hmm. were in this big truck. Uh -huh. They had one of those big old trucks with, uh, you know, wooden s sides. Oh, yeah, it's like slats. Like yeah, sides. like yeah. slats on the sides. So, mm -hmm. so that if the truck sort of had to stop quickly or something, you could grab a slat. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, they were at that, that march uh, uh -huh. in oh, Washington right. and before the war in 2003. Yeah. Well, there were people from, I don't know, all walks of life mm -hmm. and people of all ages. And yes. women really did have an important leadership role in many of yes. these groups. And, yes, they did. But it was, you know, labor were, you know, people were there protesting and people from different yeah. uh, organizations all around the country. Well, it's, uh, like I say, the 20th century was quite a century yeah. <laughs> with uh, mm -hmm. 
You know, I remember just very, very vaguely um, the early part of World War II uh -huh. and the days when America was isolationist. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, you would hear patriots uh, mm -hmm. exclaiming, you know, about all oh, these doggone isolationists, uh -huh. you know, they, they don't want us to be prepared for war or anything. Yeah. Uh, but of course it came. Yeah, well I can understand the not wanting to be involved in the war part. Yeah. You know, and yet their isolationists also included not reaching out, you know, more humanitarianly yeah, in, in that's true. assisting people around the world. So, you know, I have a lot of sympathies with part of that. Yeah. Well, after the war it was totally different. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. here we were everywhere around the world because of the yeah. Cold War, mm -hmm. which uh, <clears throat> didn't directly impact the United States in a warlike yeah. way, but mm -hmm. certainly made a huge difference in terms of economics. And yeah. I mean, there were, uh, in addition to all the bases that we had abroad, there mm -hmm. were so many bases here at home. Yeah. And the economy became quite dependent mm -hmm. on um, the military yeah. spending. And mm -hmm. like my best friend uh, worked at a base, a base in the little town that I was telling about, the uh -huh. Oasis in Nevada. Mm -hmm. Nevada had a lot of <clears throat> bases. They didn't have many towns, but practically every town had a base, base. Wow. because desert, uh, weather mm -hmm. was very good for flying, training, oh, yeah. and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, in fact, that air base that's in Fallon started in 1943, oh. and um, mm -hmm. it has been there ever since. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, of course, it's gotten bigger mm -hmm. when there was a real hot war on somewhere, you yeah. know, and other times. And so they were doing more training. And uh, other times it was a little quieter, but uh, that base is only about a mile away from where my brother lives. Yeah. And it became you know, bigger over the years. It took over more former farmland and, and desert on the edge of the desert. And my best girlfriend worked at the base. Mm -hmm. She married a sailor who was there, you know. And yeah. This happened with a lot of folks. Yeah. Well, you talk, we talk about isolationists. I mean, what happened then was becoming much more powerfully involved with countries around the world. I right. Mean, Tremendously. Yeah. Successful. Economically and militarily, I mean, making inroads into countries so that our corporations could reap benefits yes. you know from the resources of their countries and so that isolationist just went overboard the other way right in, in ways yeah. that I think that I believe have been very harmful not only for those countries but for and for our relationship with countries around the world are right. are the way other countries and other people look at America, you know, which are the seeds for what now we call terrorism, the seeds for people hating, you know, the United States, mm -hmm. as we, if we want to talk about that, so. Right, well, <clears throat> one of the other big things that was a difference after the war, mm -hmm. well, during the war, our allies were mainly uh, England, Soviet Union, and China, uh -huh, and yeah. and they, we were fighting the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, after the war, you know, hey, you know, Everything. sudden turnaround yeah, there, flips. Mm -hmm. right. down with the Soviet Russians and uh, mm -hmm. down with the communist Chinese mm -hmm. within you know yeah. a year, a couple of years, and hey, our good old friends there in Germany, you know, they've uh -huh. gotten rid of Hitler, so yeah. now they're our friends, and, and uh, the same with the Japanese. We, mm -hmm. were, we were rebuilding what, what we had uh, yeah. 
bombed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it made me rather skeptical about, about propaganda. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. How, you, how your friends can become your enemies and your enemies can become your friends mm -hmm. <laughs> practically overnight. <laughs> yeah. And what you call terrorism changes according to who it is. You yes, know, right. if they're your allies and they are killing people or certain groups of people, that's not terrorism, all right? Yeah, but if it's people that are maybe attacking your allies or, or your economic interest, you know, yeah. our oil interests in a certain place, and those mm -hmm. people are terrorists. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we saw that in Iraq. I mean, I saw that in Iraq a lot, mm -hmm. where people, civilian people who weren't part of resistance movement, happened to be in a neighborhood, you know, that our bombs fell on in Baghdad, like, say, a three, there was a neighborhood uh, of about, what, four square blocks, say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we believe that there were resistance fighters, a cell in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so our troops, you know, bombed that whole four block area. Mm -hmm. And so then to justify that, we would say we killed X amount of terrorists, mm -hmm. including all the people from that area. And so <laughs> that whole, that word became very meaningless to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be part of the propaganda mm -hmm. to show that we were making progress in this war on terrorism. Right. right. During the Vietnam mm -hmm. War, it became, um, they sort of inflated the figures, you yeah. know, right. in sort of in a, in a similar way. Mm -hmm. Well, we uh, went out and we bombed such and such a territory, and now we've gotten rid of 450 mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, enemies and and so on and sort of at the end yeah. when they added it all up it was uh, it's a very it was a very high number mm -hmm. but yeah they weren't all enemies a lot of them were people who were in the way yeah collateral it's, damage isn't that a terrible word it's a horrible word and I don't believe in collateral you know I think that when a person's killed there that's Murder, yeah. you know, yeah. that's, they're killed. You know, it's not collateral damage. Say it like it is. Yeah. Anyway, but one of the things that working in Iraq meant for me was that I was living among the people. And I saw, you know, they were real people to me. Mm -hmm. And when we're back here, we, we may see some images or short stories or whatever, something on TV, glimpses of the people and, and what happened to them, you know, and the, and the consequences of war. But when you're there immersed in it, you know, it, it, it becomes something very different. It's no longer figures that, mm -hmm. you know, or, or labels of terrorists, but these are real people that, whose lives are being taken, whose, left, whose children are now suffering cancers and leukemia because of the depleted uranium. Mm -hmm. that we proliferated around the country through the, you know, the depleted uranium in the bombs, in the bullets, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. armor of the, of the, you know, the tanks and such. And so it looks very different when you're actually there. And mm -hmm. that's one of the things I wanted to convey in my books is yes. to put a human face on the victims of war, the people that have to deal with the consequences. Because I believe if that Americans are people of goodwill. Yes. And if they really could see that and could, could know that, you know, and could really understand that, that they could not say, you know, could not go along with mm -hmm. the kind of wars that our government has been perpetrating on people around the world. Yeah, it's, um I don't know, you know, where does it all begin, where does it all end? Yeah. But, um, the other night when you spoke, you were, you were telling us stories about some of these people that you had, had met and yeah. the things they said about their own experiences and mm -hmm. what had happened to their, to their sons, their brothers, their children. Yeah.
and it's 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 real it's real when i you know we're we're listening to two brothers tell about the i don't know the very violent house raid that they experienced in the mm. you know in the middle mm -hmm. of the night when soldiers came and came in and they're told to do this i mean this is policy that they are to subdue all the men in the house within 30 or 40 seconds mm -hmm. of absolute fury they call it and of course they dra either if they're in bed they drag them out and they they have them on the floor handcuffed and begin to kick the men to subdue them and then drag them out on the military truck well in this particular case uh, the men these brothers and their uncle and their 74 year old father were all put on the truck handcuffed and they had feed sacks put over their heads and some of these feed sacks were plastic mm -hmm. and so when the, breathe. the father complained that he couldn't breathe every time he complained he was hit or cursed by US soldiers mm -hmm. and uh, and then soon he was silent Mm -hmm. because he was dead oh. and of course I will never forget the pain the pain in the eyes you know and in the voices of these brothers as they told us that story mm -hmm. I mean that's something that is just embedded on my heart mm -hmm. I, yeah yes it's uh, really really tough well, I know you do some other things as well, yeah. um, and uh, you and your late husband, Art, mm -hmm. uh, had your own farm there for so many years and used to go to farmer's market. Right. Uh -huh. And so on, environment has always been a big uh, interest. It has, yeah. Yeah, we have seen, uh, at, you know these various expressions of, of justice or peace activities are are all interconnected mm -hmm. I mean you can't separate uh, building peaceful societies or uh -huh. preventing war and injustice from caring for the earth mm -hmm. and growing wholesome food yes. you know good food so we grew organic vegetables and sold and we wanted to make that food accessible to all people and affordable to uh -huh. the common people you know uh -huh. not just the wealthier people so we saw living a life of simplicity which we try to do uh, all interconnected together with our peace and justice making mm -hmm. and just the same now I see uh, working for uh, against a you know the pollution of of our air and our waters that will you know are producing climate change mm -hmm. and I see the movement to protect the air and water you know that's being polluted through the fracking that's going on and mm -hmm. a lot of the industry to over you know to continue to exploit the oil and gas and coal resources in our society mm -hmm. to see how that also affects the economy mm -hmm. I mean it may seem like those industries bring jobs and uh, for a short time put a little money in the pockets of the landowners mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean that's true but in the long-term consequence of those those efforts to explore those minerals in our earth actually the long term is to to actually gut our economy and uh, to devalue the land by devaluing the land and and you know depleting our clean water supply and polluting the air and mm -hmm. and increasing health problems in our in our area and so when you look at it in the long run it actually does a disservice to yeah. our region yeah well, and we've been so busy sort of cleaning up the past. Yeah, I mean, uh, right. acid mine drainage from uh -huh. from yeah. the old uh, abandoned mines that are mm -hmm. still just because the rain falls, the water mm -hmm. accumulates, 
has to run out the holes, you know, in yeah. <laughs> the ground and and has to run into the streams and there you uh -huh. got the acid mine drainage. Yeah, and the people living here in the, our areas are the ones that have to live with that for generation after generation. Right, mm -hmm. and the old time coal miners mm -hmm. who yeah. suffer from black lung. Yeah, and then like what's going on in in West Virginia right now with, you know, the pollution of the water from the, the leaks of the chemicals going into the water. And now those companies are not really putting the money out to clean that up. And they're leaving the debt of all that on the, on the common taxpayer. Yeah. And they're the ones that are going to be paying for that to try to reclaim, you know, the water and the land. Uh, from that damage and and so it ends up being a burden on the poor yeah continually being a burden on and the poor. you have uh, mm -hmm. mountaintop removal yeah <laughs> right <laughs> which not only leaves yeah. you know vast areas where there's mm -hmm. level land uh, but what did they do with the dirt oh just push it over into the next valley you know, yeah. and disrupt the stream that's there and mm -hmm. you know whatever yeah, it's um, we don't always think ahead that much. Yeah, and so one of the things that I believe is that it's really important to work together, to see those interconnections, and it's not just a group of people that are now here on this side working for justice or peace or re reclamation of the land or preventing climate change against landowners. It really is all of us in it together. And we need to build those connections and, um, and really listen to each other and try to, I don't know, just dissolve that us against, you know, we against you or mm -hmm. type of atmosphere that I believe it's the uh, companies or the, that are trying to foster those kind of divisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the work of anyone working for peace is to you know, to kind of dissolve those differences, those walls, and for us to to really work together uh, to see our commonality, uh, yes. common ground that we have. And uh, that means that you need to have groups that are mm -hmm. working to bring people together. That's right. Uh -huh. Like Appalachian uh, Peace and Justice Network. Network. Yes. yes, and Rural Action. Rural Action. There's groups that are doing that. Yeah. Working with local people. You used mm -hmm. to work for Appalachian Peace and Justice, That's didn't right. You? For 11 years, I was. 11 years. Co-director, yes. Uh -huh. That was good. good part of my life. Yes. yes. That time. was before Iraq. That was before I ever got involved in Palestine or Iraq. Mm -hmm. I worked with Christian peacemaker teams. Yeah. Yes, and at that time, I mean, we were we were working with local groups around the area uh, who were working to uh, I don't know against some of the racial mm -hmm. uh, injustice that was you know, and to bring people of different races and ethnic groups together mm -hmm. in our region. Um, we were working. There were many groups that were just as little groups, house cells that were working for uh, on different, like either anti-nuclear or anti-war types mm -hmm. of issues mm -hmm. or economic justice issues. So mm -hmm. we gave support and would often have training workshops to hone our skills yes. in peacemaking or in organizing work. I noticed that uh, yeah. um, United Campus Ministry is having its Social Justice Awards uh, mm -hmm. next week. That's right. And uh, some interesting uh -huh. groups that are being uh, mm -hmm. Black Student Union, yeah. uh, Hillel got swabbed. I wonder what the heck mm -hmm. that is. <laughs> but we'll find out we'll next find week, out. won't yeah. we? Uh -huh. But one of the really nice things is that you're going to be honored. That's right. I, <laughs> I am humbled by that. It's a real honor to.
be a part of that and to receive one of their awards. Right. Mm -hmm. Cure Griesinger Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah. And of course, that is named for Carol Cure uh -huh. and Jan Griesinger, who uh, led UCM for so long, especially right. Jan was, was there for 30 years at least, wasn't right, she? Something. Yeah, I don't know the exact amount. Right. <clears throat> and Carol yeah. uh, went on to really found Rural Action. It was already mm -hmm. going as a, as a, mm -hmm. with a different name, but uh, yeah. Rural Action in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. But she had also been, were, were you at APJN when Carol was there, or was that after your yes, time? Yes, Carol was instrumental in helping uh, APJN be formed in the start. And I'm trying to remember exactly when she, uh, you know, left her work at, at, at UCM. I can't remember exactly, but mm -hmm. she, I remember I was part of the committee that met together in the formation of APJN. That's mm -hmm. before I became a, a staff member there of the uh -huh. group. But Carol was very much a part of that. Both Carol and, and Jan, both very effective organizers and workers for justice and peace and are still working hard yes. in, in many areas. Yeah. <clears throat> so the award is, is named for uh, mm -hmm. Carol Cure and mm -hmm. Jan Griesinger. Yeah. And um, the 2013 recipient, the recipient for 2013, Peggy Fogg-ish. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> And let's see, that event is Wednesday, March 19th. That's right, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, a week from today, actually, yes. since we're taping on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. A week from today um, at United Campus Ministry, UCM, mm -hmm. 18 North College, from 6 to 8 o'clock. Right, and to anyone listening who might not be familiar with these groups or with the work of UCM, I invite you to come and be really encouraged and excited by these groups of young, not all of them are just groups of young people, but many of them are, who right. are, are now starting to discover and their own leadership abilities and are starting to make a difference in our world. Yes. It's going to be quite an active um, time, actually, because, uh, well, I'm thinking, I mentioned before about the mm -hmm. um, women's, the International Women's Day event on this coming Sunday, Sunday yeah. afternoon, March 16th at Baker Center Ballroom, uh -huh. the new Baker oh, yeah. Center. Uh -huh. And it's the sixth year. Uh -huh. I've worked with the committee uh, for six years myself. Uh -huh. And uh, so, I'm wearing my take from <clears throat> the past, not its ashes, but its fire. Here's the good, good kind of fire. The good kind of fire, <laughs> right. And we all need that kind of fire that motivates us. Yes, we know, do. To work. Um, so that's one event that's upcoming. And you know, I was reading too about uh, in early April, there's uh -huh. going to be a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the visit to Southeast Ohio of President Lyndon Johnson. Oh, yes. And his announcement about war on poverty and uh -huh. helping the Appalachian area uh -huh. and uh, all that. It's uh, April 2nd and 3rd, I believe. And yeah. it's going to be a really important um, celebration. Yeah, that is important. They're going to have a bus tour on Thursday, April 2nd, and on the next day they're going to have, on uh, Friday, April 3rd, they're going to have workshops uh -huh. about poverty issues, and um, it's supported by the Ohio Program and the Humanities, uh -huh. among other, I imagine they're providing some of the money for uh -huh. people Little Cities of Black Diamonds is going to be involved. Uh-huh, yeah. And, um, gosh, <laughs> I, yeah. I wasn't here then. We came in the fall of 1964, and it was in the spring of 1964 that uh -huh. uh, 
LBJ was here. Wow. Long, long ago. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're getting about toward the end here, Peggy, mm -hmm. and okay. we want to mention your book, or your both books again. Walking Through Fire is the most recent uh -huh. one. Yeah. Walking Through Fire. And then your earlier one about your first adventures in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Iraq, A Journey of Hope and Peace. And uh, it's really wonderful that you've left these records. Yeah. And they are either available at our local bookstores or mm -hmm. if they're not there, order them through them. But yes. it's always good to support our local businesses. Yes, it is. <laughs> right. And to support Peggy Gish. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, any support of this just helps support future work. That's so right. Future work. I hope to keep working like this as long as I'm able. Oh, good. And yeah. do you have any plans for possibly going back to Iraq? Well, I don't have definite plans, but I am uh, thinking of going back to Iraq probably mid-July. Mid-July. Yeah. In the summer For again. another probably two months' uh -huh. time. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, mm -hmm. keep on keeping on. Well, thank you. And <laughs> same to you. Thank you. Keep on keeping on the good work that you've been doing. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. This is Lois yeah. Whaley for Women Today and Yesterday, thanking Peggy Gish again for being our guest. Mm -hmm.